Hi guys, <laughs> welcome back. I just wanted to start with saying thank you for 5,000 subscribers. I can't believe it. I just, I just can't believe it. I'm so, I'm so chuffed. I'm so, I'm so pleased. Thank you for all of you that have been watching for a long time, and um, even you know the new people that have found me. It's, it's, it's lovely. I really appreciate it. I appreciate all the tips on coffee um, and people that have found me on Instagram and all of that kind of thing. But most of all, the most important thing you can do is watch my videos and interact with them if you can. That's what gets me to this point, you know, is, um, is, is you guys watching it. I, I can't do this without you, otherwise I'm sort of howling in the wind. Okay, I'm not even sure if I've redid the camera anyway. Hello! From the title, I would like my workroom to be aesthetically pleasing. There's bits of it that are, but there's bits of it that clearly aren't, you can see behind me. I did think of tidying it all up, and then I thought, well, I don't want to pretend like I'm some sort of perfect person that and my workroom's always tidy. It isn't. My workroom 90% of the time looks like this because with a filming schedule and we've actually, I do have a filming schedule, yes, um, and we're actually making stuff. Making stuff makes a mess, but making a creative mess is completely different from just like making a mess. It's a thought process and this is something that I've tried to get across to students over the years. It's not about presenting. Tidy isn't creative. I mean ways of tidying are, but being tidy is not necessarily creative. If you can't see it, you can't be inspired by it. If you can't touch it, you can't be inspired by it. So what ends up happening to me is I get out a lot of options and will look at them and select them and not put them away because when I'm filming I might want to refer to something. Um, because all of this is unscripted because I am um, dyslexic which I've mentioned. It's all unscripted so I need stuff that is around that will remind me of part of the process, what the inspiration was, what the colour palette was, that kind of thing. But then I also have a chronic health condition which means that I will go all out, film something, I might even start by designing something so I can take a couple of days designing something, pulling out all the bits and pieces that I need, then I will film it, um, then I'll make sure that I've got photographs of it, then I'll make sure that the stuff is left out so my son can photograph it if he needs to for the thumbnail and all that stuff. By that point, I'm absolutely done for. It's nearly the weekend and I think, oh, I'll get to it on Monday. And then we start all over again. So I have it stratified. This is a long way of telling you that I wanted to show you what my real life is like, not the pretty version of my life that, oh, she's so together. I am not so together. In some things I am. In this, I, I don't even try anymore. And you know what? Since I stopped trying, I've stopped caring. And I actually am way more creative than probably at any other time in my entire life which is pretty amazing so considering I'm over 50 that is that is really cool. I do appreciate that some people find mess stressful I totally get that and I do appreciate that some people don't have the luxury of being able to have a room where you can shut the door and abandon it and you can't see it so it doesn't stress you out. I totally get that I really do. I've been that person too. And so you have to do what makes you feel comfortable. But I just want to show you, this is what my real life is like, okay? So, how am I going to make this room more aesthetically pleasing without actually tidying up? I thought I'd do something just a little bit fun today. I have a list of 12 possible videos I could film today. Um, not one of them sparked any interest in them at all. Probably because I was missing a couple of bits and I like to have, you know, all of the equipment that you need before I start something. That's probably what it was, I hope so. Except this one. So I thought I'd do something a little bit thrifty. Last summer I went to a town um, nearby and I purchased, actually I think my partner purchased it for me, this rather lovely chest of drawers. So it's a little three drawer chest. And to give you some idea of size, they're seven inches high and five inches deep. The drawers themselves will be about eight and a half inches, I think. So it gives you an idea of the size. You do see little things like this quite often. 
And I think originally it was, you know, probably just quite sweet. It's, it's quite nicely made. It's been made with like little grooves to stick things in rather than it's not stapled. So I'm guessing it might be, I don't know, 1950s or 60s. But you can see the top has got something not very nice on it. It's a bit worn. It clearly isn't this colour underneath. And I'm not a big fan of this sort of mid-century colour anyway. It's really strange. A lot of my friends are. They, they love mid-century stuff. I, no, I don't really like it. So I want to make this into something useful. Now it is already useful the way it is. And I've been putting my quilt thread in it. You know, it's, it's quite handy the way it is. And you can fit 10 reels of thread in, which is quite nice. I don't like this stuff inside. Let me take these out. Actually, now I'm feeling it, it's not that bad. It's, someone's used corduroy on the inside. But what it makes me think of is, you know that shiny stuff that looks a bit like this, that catches on your nails that they used to use in jewellery boxes and things like that back in like the 60s and 70s. And I think it's something to do with the colour. <laughs> it makes me think of that, but that's such a shame because it is actually corduroy. But anyway, these are the drawers. So they're quite nicely made. Originally I was going to cover the inside. Hmm, not sure. I don't think I can stain this. I'd be worried. I live in a very a country with quite high humidity all year round. And I'm wondering how stable a dye would be if it was a paint on dye that you can't rinse out. I definitely do not want that to transfer onto my thread. And this is for thread. I think I'm going to have to cover it with something. So yeah, that is going to get recovered. But the outside, what I'm going to do, just going to give it a light sand off to give it a key all over. And I'm going to varnish it with a tinted polyurethane varnish. I'm pretty sure you can get that like all over the world, wherever you happen to be. If you're not sure about varnishes and stuff, it would be something that they probably call quick dry varnish. It will dry in about 20 minutes, an hour max. I'm going to use one in a sort of a walnut colour, just because there's a little hint of orange in this and I do not like orange pine or anything, you know, like when it oxidises. So I want to make sure that I knock that back and walnut. And then I thought to make this a bit more exciting rather than just a little chest of drawers. I thought I'd show you the other thing I found. In the same town, on the same day, different shop, couldn't believe it. It's, um, it's like a little mannequin thing on a stand. Can you see that? Eh? Like that. So I found it and it had a label on it and it said um, vintage 1940s mannequin and I looked at it and I went, I don't think so. To me it looks like something from the 1980s. It's sort of more of a blonde wood orange oxidised pine so that's the wrong colour for a start. But also if it was from the 1940s it would be for a completely different shape. I'm going to also sand this off and re-varnish these parts as well. And then I'll do all of those, all of the sort of sanding, dusty, then the wet stuff like with the varnish. I'll do that first before I do anything with fabric. But I thought it might be rather nice to... This has just got tissue paper stuck on it, which is okay, but she's... She's not very yielding. I did think I might have a go at putting some wadding over her, gluing some wadding over her first, and then attempting to cover her with fabric, but actually cut to size, you know, in the shapes and everything. So that's gonna be hilarious, isn't it? So these are the things to make my workroom more aesthetically pleasing. Come and join me in on top of the freezer where I'm going to go and sand them down. And just a little word of caution, you're going to be sanding down something but you don't want to take all the varnish off, you know, you're not actually trying to get back to bare wood. Don't use anything too fierce as a sandpaper. You just want something, I don't know what grade this is, it doesn't say. I just want to go over and give it a bit of a key everywhere so that the new varnish will stick to it. We have a slight problem, I don't know if you can see this. It's gone back to the bare wood quite easily, so what will happen if I go over that with a tinted varnish now, that will come up lighter than this, so. Who's got to take it all off? Okay, I'm pretty sure I've got all of the varnish off the top. That's all I need to do on there. I'm not, I'm not doing the rest of it like that, which means that the rest of the chest of drawers will be darker than the top. 
But that's okay. I can always put two coats on the top. And to be honest, I don't think it really matters anyway. On bits like this, that you can't see a great deal of it, but you will be able to see if you take the drawers all the way out. I'm just going to sand across the front. So that's another thing that gives away that it's a little bit older than it looks is the colour of it goes all the way through but the actual draw supports don't go all the way to the back. Just literally you need to rub it, rough it up a bit. Just anywhere that um, is going to be varnished, anywhere that you want to change the colour, just need to give it a little rub over with the sandpaper. Always go with the direction of the grain. So that's the grain, see it always sand that way, not across it because it'll look awful. <laughs> These drawers are being a little awkward because of their little handles. Just do the best you can. It wasn't an expensive piece of furniture. It was in a junk shop anyway. This one's slightly different. You still have to try and go in the direction of the grain, but where there's so much turning, the main object of the exercise is to just make a key and get this varnish is really textured. There's glue lumps on it. And then the most important thing is to get that off. Right, <laughs> I think that's as good as it's going to get. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give these a good wipe down. I'll come back to the other drawers in a minute. For something like this, where you're not back to the virgin wood and it's been oxidised and varnished and hardened over many years, just a microfiber duster that's wet or damp is absolutely fine to get the dust off. If this was virgin wood, so it never had anything done to it and you just sanded it, don't use don't use just a wet cloth. Um, use something like Terps Turpentine Substitute or White Spirit, something sort of solvent based because it evaporates quickly and it will take out any grease marks and that kind of thing. Or ask someone, ask someone in your local DIY store what to use. Okay, this is what it looks like when it's been sanded. So you just see it looks just really rough and a bit flat looking. I was thinking about it last night about what this video was actually about. And I was thinking, how boring is that to sit and watch me just varnish something? I know it's what I had in my mind of what I wanted to do, but honestly, I think you're all capable enough of doing some varnish. You might not know about some of the things I told you about preparation of wood, and that's fair enough, but I thought I would talk to you about the other ideas that I had had for this little piece. And then I'm going to teach you a little technique of mine that I've been using for a long time that makes it look as though the wood has been painted with an intricate design. All will be revealed. So first of all, if I had been able to get these off, I would not have just varnished it. I would have taken on painting it and actually painting different things and then putting the drawer handles back on. I cannot get under here to sand without damaging these handles. That That's out. I can't, even if I wanted to be exciting and all the rest of it, I cannot do that. But I would have painted it probably in a light colour, like a light cream or something, done something on each one of these and then I probably would have aged it up in here to look, you know, sort of very vintagey aged up all these details I could still do that here if I wanted to so I'm going to show you how to make this top bit look as though it's been painted with you know like hand painted flowers first of all what I'll do is I will varnish it all first but only up to this edge here and I'll do all the drawers and all the rest of it. So that will still be varnished in the in the dark walnut. And then I will probably actually before I before I do that I'll be I'll measure all of these pieces. So I need to measure the top, I need to measure the drawers. I've ummed and ahed and ummed and ahed. You would not believe the things that keep me awake at night <laughs> about whether or not to do these or not and actually you know although it's corduroy and although that's pretty decent and it's been done quite well it is really scuzzy in there it's dirty it's dusty it does need refreshing so I'm definitely going to do that so what I thought I would do was I would make the top and the inside of the drawers not match but go together so here's some suggestions of fabrics I could use them that couple there I also really, really love this fabric and I thought this would make a great top because it's got beautiful compact motifs on it. I could put them on like that, which actually doesn't look quite as nice as I thought it was. I could go down a completely different route and use one of my all-time favourite fabrics. No, I don't really like that. 
We've got some paisley. Oh, now that looks quite nice. That's surprising. I thought that was going to be inside a drawer. That looks quite nice. I've got another Toile de Jouet. I love Toile de Jouet. I think this is the most successful one of what I wanted, which was like a central motif. And for the end effect, which is to make it look like this has been painted. So now we have to think about what's going in the drawers, which has kind of ruined that because all the things I got out were to go with the grey fabric. I'll just show you a few other ideas I had. I've got this. I think it's a climped fabric. I've also got things like this with the clocks on, which would look quite nice. I think it'd be quite nice to line the drawers actually. And one with keys and a similar sort of colour palette. To go with that grey that I'm not going to use, I had all these little ditzy prints. I'd rather it looked, you know, like you open the drawers and there's something similar inside. So the only ones I've got are this one, this paisley, and this one. Or do I do them all paisley? It's like a terrible waste of a really nice fabric. But maybe if I started by measuring it and seeing actually what I need fabric wise. When you're doing anything like this, measure in the measurements you are used to using. If you are used to doing inches for fabric then use inches. If you are used to using centimetres then use centimetres. I would say that this bit where you're going to cut the fabric needs to be absolutely spot on. So that can also influence what you're measuring with because this, the top piece, measures 9 and 11 sixteenths or it measures 24 centimetres with another six on top. That's actually the easier measurement. You can get away with it being just like a thread too small because the fabric's going to stretch. Doesn't matter what you do, when you put it on, when you glue it on, it always stretches. Even if you prepare it and starch it, which we are going to do, it's still going to stretch, always. I've never managed to do it and it not stretch. So I'm actually going to write this down as 24.6, I think. I need to measure front to back. So this again is going to be more accurate in a different measurement. So I've written one down in millimetres. So now I'm going to write it down in inches because it's five and a quarter inches. I will also write the millimetres underneath just in case I get confused. Okay, so that's the top measurement. What I'll do is I'll do all the measurements first of all of these. Then I will varnish it, stick it on one side to dry. And then while it's drying, I can be preparing the fabric for all of the drawers and the top. I think I'm going to cut that. It's actually an inch and a quarter, but I'm going to cut it at, at an inch and a half so that I can fold over a quarter of an inch at the top to make it nice and neat. I am going to measure that that's an inch and a quarter all the way around. So then I just need to look at this. This is still going to be varnished around here. I've been looking at this and actually proportion wise, it's already a little bit big for the stand. The stand could actually deal with being a couple of inches taller. And she's got no roundness anywhere because I, I was thinking about oh I could make her like a little corset, like a proper historically accurate corset. But then I was thinking am I just going to blur whatever shape is on here with wadding? I think I'm just going to cover her in fabric. Or I could just varnish her and leave her like that for now. Because this paper that's on it is quite pretty it's just been put on a bit slapdash and there's you know rips and stuff in it but for now i think once the wood's been smartened up it'll probably look pretty nice and rather than rushing to do something that i'm not quite sure about because while i was just sitting there thinking and looking at fabric and stuff i thought i could make her a dress or something and then in which case i probably only want to paint this i might not even do that you know i could make her a little something i'm not going to do that now i'm just going to varnish it and then we'll call that done we'll make the emphasis on the um chest of drawers Okay, I've started varnishing the um, chest. I've done all the interior varnishing and tried to make sure there aren't any drips or anything. This is what the varnish looks like. It's sort of like a really weird grey cloudy stuff. 
So I'm using a small artist's oil brush because I want a short bristle length. And I don't want to make bubbles and I don't want to leave hairs in it. It's small. Okay, so I've got to do up under here to get this bit. And then I'm going to work with the grain all the way down here. So you're just going to have to trust me on that because I can't hold it at that angle. So I'm just going to work with the grain like so. And I'm pulling the varnish down. And the, the brilliant thing about tinted varnish is it gives it a bit of aged upness because it'll sit in the crevices and stuff i just need to pull it off of these corners now i've got a big long sort of bit here that needs just pulling back into the main body of the varnish and then the very last bit that i want to do is this bit i haven't reloaded my brush at all and that's deliberate because i don't want any drippage i don't want it to go around the side underneath and pull so I'm using every last bit I've got on the brush so that I don't have to reload the brush and also I want this to be perfect this bit I'm not sure that this is as dark as I want it so I've done one coat it's a very thin coat and then I'll put that on one side just to dry so this one's going to be even more fun I've masking taped off the jaw handles which meant I was able to stick them upright which is kind of handy I mean I could do all these let it dry go back and do the next bit but mm, I'm not going to you know I'm not going to so let's go all the way around the squares first I'm not worrying about if there's brush marks or anything at the moment I'm just trying to get a little bit of varnish everywhere that it needs to be and then I'll go and tidy up all those drips and stuff in a minute the grain of what I'm using is quite obvious on the wood so even if I actually varnished across the wrong way you probably wouldn't notice but on some things you will really see if you, if you varnish it the wrong way so if like, I did it all like that it would look a bit weird that looks pretty good actually just make sure there's no drips so I shall just do the last two drawers this is one that I've varnished this one and this is the one that's just been sanded look at the difference just one coat So I'm going to go and finish doing the last drawer and then I will put all of this to dry and then I will be measuring and cutting all the fabric for the drawer unit because this just needs a few more coats. I didn't work on the fabric while it was drying because I ended up putting four coats on the chest of drawers. This is what it looks like now. That's the top. You can see the colour difference. There's a few little extra bits of pooling of varnish. That's the worst thing about this varnish. It really gives a lovely effect, but you do have to be careful and put very, very thin coats on to get the best result. And it, it does actually look really nice. So that's the base of the chest of drawers. Here are the drawer fronts themselves. They look much nicer. I'll just pop them in. You can see what it looks like. It looks so much nicer. So four coats, and then I thought I'd better leave that to dry for a long time so I left it overnight again. I'm really glad I did because it, yeah it's completely dry now. This is what the mannequin looks like and it looks so much nicer even though I've done nothing to this part. Just doing the stand I'm quite happy to leave it like this and have a really good think about what I want to do to it rather than rushing and having to redo it so I'm, I'm happy to leave that how it is at the moment I think it looks great and it also means that I can show you exactly how to prepare the fabric so these are the fabrics I've chosen this is for the top I need to find the right piece which I think was this bit here. I think that will fit across quite well so I'm just going to starch that piece. I could have used this house but I didn't want the donkey's bottom in the picture so I need to make a note of that bit there. I'm going to use a bit of this but I like it so much <laughs> you know me in a good paisley. I don't want to do all of the drawers out of it. I think there would be enough but I, I don't want to just waste it on the drawers so I'll just have a little bit of that. So one of the drawers will be in that and the other two will be out of this fabric which I've clearly had for a long time. What we need to do is starch some of the fabric. It's just a spray starch so whatever spray starch you use or can get hold of. Make sure you give it a good shake and this one's really cold and you just want a thin layer in the area that you're going to use. Now you can't see it but if you feel it it will feel very slightly damp. 
and because I've just touched it all over, I'll spray it again. And then you put it on one side, not to dry, but to soak into the fibres for about five minutes. It won't be dry in that time, unless you live in a really warm place. And then we're going to iron it. And I always starch the back, not the front. I all iron from the front, because sometimes starch, if it's still quite wet, will burn. And it leaves horrible marks. And then we'll be able to cut it out. It just means that where there's not any sewing, you know, to edge anything. It just means that the um, fibres will fit as straight as possible and it won't fray, you know, in the in the manipulation of, of putting it in the drawers and, and on top of the thing. Right, so I've done the ironing. Move the ironing board out of the way, but don't put it away because we need to do one more thing with it. Now, remember we took the measurements. So I can see the ladies here from here to here is the measurement. So I can see where the grain line is. Now, some fabrics are not printed on the grain line. That might make your choice for you as to what type of fabric, what print you use you'll find where you're not sewing a seam, you're not putting an edge on it or anything, that there'll be lots and lots of little bits where it's cut sort of through various parts of the threads, you know, instead of a ball being on one straight line, it will like go a little bit across. And so that can fray. Now, if you can get it onto the piece of furniture or whatever you're putting it onto and then cover it with varnish quickly, you might get away with it, I would say for your first attempt, don't use a fabric like that. After you've done it a couple of times, you'll you'll know how to how to do it. These are a bit more straightforward. These are just strips of fabric, so this is not complicated at all. So each of the draw bases measures eight inches by four inches. Each of the saw short sides um, is four inches, and each of the long sides is eight inches. So those are your biggest measurements ever. Is, is four and eight inches so you can just cut a piece I'm going to square this up first because it's gone a little bit wonky in the starching process you can just cut pieces that actually measure four inches wide or eight inches wide or what I'm going to do is cut a piece that actually measures eight inches all the way across here and then I'll just cut off chunks of what I need and that's probably the most economical way of doing it and then I can chop off whatever I need. So I know that there's an inch over there, so I've got a four inch piece here. I'm gonna cut that off of there. So I need another one of those. I've done a third one and put the other one out of the way. I'm going to cut the four end pieces. Again, just line it up with this, so I've got one and a half. So I've got my end bits cut out for the drawers as well. And I've got a spare bit which looks sufficiently different to those that I won't get them muddled up. Hold on to that just in case you mess up one of the end bits and then you've already got a bit of the right size. Off of this piece, we need some one and a half inch wide strips by eight inches for the long sides of the drawer. So we've got the draw bottom, short side, long side. And then when we've got all these bits, what we need to do is fold them over a scant quarter of an inch and press them down. Actually, you could probably finger press them if you're confident of getting a straight line, which I am not today. <laughs> That's a bit more plain. But anyway, we're going to press down a scant quarter of an inch. That means a, just slightly less than a quarter of an inch because it takes up some of the measurement just on the fold itself, then the bulk of having the fabric around the back. So it means that it won't be too short in the drawer. So I've cut out all of the bits now. All we need to do is just fold a little turn that's just slightly less than a quarter of an inch. And the main thing is, as long as it's straight, we can probably lose the rest of the fabric in the corners anyway. So we've got to do all of these little fiddly bits. That's why I was thinking if you had a long strip, you could just do the whole thing and then cut the bits off, but actually you would waste fabric that way. So if you can't do it by eye, you can measure from the raw edge the amount you want to do the turn. See, I can't do it by eye either, that's really wonky. So I'm going to go and fight with these as best I can, and then I'll come back.
Right, so I've done the chest of drawers. I've done, oh, sorry, I've done the drawers. And when you do them, if you do something like this, you'll be able to spend a little bit more time than I have <laughs> to make them look nice and neat. So I'll put those over there on one side to completely dry. And then I'm just gonna move on to this bit. So I cut out my square, well, my rectangle of fabric, and it fits perfectly on here. In fact, it's a tiny little, tiny, like a thread's worth too small, which is what we want because it's gonna stretch. I know it's gonna stretch. But just before we do anything else, this needs to be sealed. And I could have done it with PVA. I thought about doing it with PVA and then I thought, because I'm gonna be using this afterwards as well, I'll use this to seal it. And it's just, I don't know if the glue is gonna pull anything out of the wood and where I'm using a pale colored fabric, that would be terrible. <laughs> It's the only bit on that fat quarter that would actually fit on here. It would be ruined if it pulled some brown marks through it. So, so this is like a um, Mod Podge or something like that, I think. It's, um, you know when you do uh, paper craft and... You know, I know on the thing it says acrylic paint, but underneath it's actually matte varnish. So this is what I'm using on here. So I just want to put a barrier between the glue and this stuff. So I'm going to leave that to dry, and then when that's dry, I'm going to glue the fabric on. What you need to do after that, I'm really not sure about this, I'll see how it dries. Once it's the glue has dried and it's settled, you need to varnish it with a clear polyurethane varnish. And there's no point in using a satin or anything shiny like that. I mean, well you can, eventually it'll build it up, but um, it'll sink into the fabric and then you need about three or four coats. It depends how thick the fabric is and how sort of lacquered-y you want it to look. So when you've finished varnishing and you've done three or four layers of it, that's what it will look like. Um, that was done 13 years ago and you can wipe it clean. You can, it's, it's indestructible. It's absolutely brilliant technique. So this seems to have dried reasonably clear. So I think I might actually use it to varnish the top part. So now there's the exciting bit. I'm going to glue this on. So I'm going to use Fabri-Tac. Um, you could use PVA. Earlier on I said the varnish was like Mod Podge. It's not. It's varnish. Well, you've established that now. Mod Podge is more like PVA. You could use PVA to glue this on. You could also use PVA to put the first layer over the top of the fabric. I'm not going to. It's another reason why you seal it first, because otherwise the glue would just go straight into the wood. I'm just going to spread it. There's no lumpy bits. You do have to be a little bit quick. I would say start from the front and don't press it down until you think it's in the right place. Don't drag it and I trimmed this ever so slightly short, I think I already said, but anyway. Now, there are a couple of little bits here. I wouldn't touch it until it's dry. You can get in there with a tiny pair of scissors and just snip that off. Very last thing we need to do is take the bits of masking tape off. Here's one drawer completely finished taking the masking tape off. It's covered inside. I think we just have to put some thread in it. There. What do we think of that? So there it is. It's gone from okay, a bit tired with turquoisey stuff in it, to something that's really quite cute. I really hope you have found this useful. It's a great way of covering uh, surfaces especially if it's a high wear area. So if you've got an old sideboard or something and you've got some fabric that you like, you can use upholstery fabric too. It doesn't have to be quilting cotton or anything, but you can you can use this and it'll give it a whole new lease of life. And it's really, really hard wearing. You could put plants on it, you know, and if the, if the water spills over, it's not gonna damage it because it will actually be waterproof by the time it's finished. Thanks for joining me. I've really enjoyed messing around with this. It has been great fun. I should do more of it. I think it's nice to just spend time doing something just because. So thanks for joining me as always. And again, thank you so much for 5,000 subscribers. I can't believe it. And I'll see you again soon. Bye.